Let's continue singing on the last verse of hymn 408. Happy in God, the world has fail about you. Happy in God, He provides for His own. He cannot fail, to all kingdom shall perish. He rules in vain. God's people say, amen. amen, amen, and good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody, and I'll tell you what, it's especially good to see Delia this morning, amen. amen. What a blessing. Amen. Everybody's been praying for you. You just look so bright and shiny. You had that when you left, and you brought it back with you, amen. How are you feeling? Yeah, I can imagine. Thank the Lord. Well, we love you, and everybody's been praying, and we're so excited to see you, for sure. And uh, it's good to have each and every one of you here today. I'm going to ask Pastor Ashley to open us up in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much uh, for your grace and mercy to new every morning. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness in our lives, uh, even the death of the cross at Calvary. Mm. And Lord, we pray for anyone here this morning that does not know your Savior, Lord. I pray that they would recognize your love for them. Uh, see their need for the for the salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, Lord, we just want to ask that you just meet with us this morning. Use our pastor, fill him with your spirit. And, Lord, I pray that uh, we would uh, humbly uh, bow to your command and as we seek to see thy will in your word, even this morning. And, Lord, may you have your way in our hearts and in our lives, and may you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Let's all be seated. Good to see again each and every one of you out. We're also thankful for... Uh, anyone who might be visiting for the first time, for sure. Do we have any introductions? Any introduction? Uh, they're not here right now. <laughs> so please pray for it's, Her name is Jennifer, and uh, his son, I think the son is nine years old. And uh, please pray for them right now. I think Sister Maddie is witnessing to them, sharing the plan of salvation. Where are you at? Oh, they're back? There you go. There you go. Jennifer and Roy Lee. Amen. Amen. Good to have you. It's good to know that Mario can't see any better than I can. Amen. What a blessing. Any other introductions? Daniel. Uh huh. Cindy. Good to have you back with us. Amen. What a blessing. Hey, folks, good to have you folks with us. Praise the Lord. Man, let's make sure that they get a special gift from us and a uh, welcome packet. We're happy to have you as our honored guest today. Amen? All right. Any others? Any other introductions? Well, it's good to have each and every one. Let's share a few quick announcements and we'll continue with the service. Please notice, Monday, that would be as in tomorrow, we're still going to have church. I'll tell you, you, you talk about the saying three to thrive. That's when you're here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. This week, make it four to thrive, four days in a row, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Lord will bless you in a special way. That I can promise you. And if you don't believe me, try me, okay? Come on out. But this Monday, be here with uh, all of our folks. We're going to have uh, special music. We're going to have... Uh, orchestra members here and choir here and we're also going to have a very special guest a dear friend a brother in the lord a tremendous preacher god is using him all around the world nationally he speaks at uh, the biggest conferences in the country and uh, you know he was one time asked um, how come there are certain churches you don't go to and he says because they don't ask well i asked and he said i'd be happy to come to the valley and and be with you, Brother Miller. And so, Brother R.B. Woulette will be with us. Some of you remember a few years back, we went to a pastor's uh, a, a spiritual leadership conference in uh, Lancaster, 
uh, we loaded up a van and took some folks over there. And this has been quite a few years. Well, Brother Willette has always preached at that spiritual leadership conference with Paul Chapel, and uh, uh, I thought, how much more of a blessing is it that I can bring him to our church and he can be a blessing to all of my family? Amen. And so I, I can't get you all in one van and take you to Lancaster. How about this? He comes here. And uh, I guarantee you, he will have uh, God's word for you. You don't want to miss out. This is also a good time, I'll tell you. Bring friends. Bring co-workers. You're thinking, I, I've been trying to come up with a good way, something to get this fella down to the church house. And maybe they can't make it on Sundays or even Wednesdays or something like that, but they can, you know what? They can come for this special event. Just talk it up, bring them, and I guarantee you, uh, the lost will come to know Christ. Those who are struggling in their faith will be encouraged, and every single one of us, I can guarantee you the Lord has something special for us uh, that the Lord will use this man to speak to our hearts. And so just make up your mind, and I'm just going to start with Monday. I don't want to overdo it. Let's start out right with Monday. Uh, a very special, special event here at your church, 7 p.m. Let's everybody be here. Amen? And please notice another special event, uh, Finance Committee. <laughs> finance Committee will have a quick meeting uh, Wednesday following the service, okay? And then Thanksgiving. How many people like Thanksgiving? Amen? How many people like to eat during Thanksgiving? How many people, by the time it gets to Christmas, you've eaten just about all there is to eat? Amen? Yes, Thanksgiving is right around the corner and our uh, family Thanksgiving will be Sunday, November 19th. Uh, food and sign-up sheet will be uh, ready next week so you can begin to make your plans and fill in those little slots there, amen? With all the favorite foods of, of, of Pastor Ashley and I, amen? Which would be anything, pretty much. Awana, again, Pray for Awana, excited about Awana, ages three to sixth grade, and that's three years old to sixth grade uh, on Wednesday, starts at 645. Any other announcement? Yes, Mrs. Miller. I would like to see if I can get a little help setting out five round tables in the open area in the fellowship hall after church today. Um, and also, I have a, an issue with some plumbing, so if you want to try your skills, just see me after church and I'll Please turn to him, 345, 345, Blessed Assurance, 345. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Sing my Savior. Oh. 
Let's all stand one more time as we sing hymn number 26. A mighty fortress is our God. 26 to 6.
I sure enjoyed that choir special. We actually had uh, uh, orchestra accompanying the uh, special today. That was special. How about that? Amen? Amen. And you know what else is special? We have, I'm just looking at, we have two of our missionary families with us uh, besides some of our uh, homes missionaries. Uh, of course, uh, the lilies back there. Wave at everybody, Brother Larry. There you go. And uh, right over here, the Hernandez's, Brother Valente. Give us a big wave. Let everybody see that you guys are here. Just in Mexico ministry here, we've got a <laughs> several years, I'll just say, several years represented in, in experience. And so sure good to have all of you with us. Amen. Brother Benny, would you look to the Lord for the offering, sir? Our Father in heaven, we come before you, dear Lord, giving to you all the praise and all the glory, thanking you for your son, for your word, for our salvation. Lord, now open our hearts, dear Lord, as Pastor Miller, your message to us this morning. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. Now that we pick up this offering, Lord, we pray that you multiply and be used for your ministry, dear Lord. We pray all this in your son's precious holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name, the sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass or oh, whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Beneath you, oh, mon âme, oh, mon âme, rend gloire à son Seigneur. Oh, chante comme jamais, oh, mon âme, je rends gloire à ton nom. Voici l'aura, l'aube d'un nouveau jour. Pour toi, un chant doit s'élever Devant ce qui m'attend et ce qui pourrait arriver Qu'à la fin du jour, je te chante encore J'ai des milliers de raisons pour louer Que tout domicile, glorias de adios Su nombre santo es, canta como nunca, oh mi alma, tu nombre alabaré. El sol nació, ya es un nuevo día, 
es tiempo de cantarte otra vez. Pase lo que pase y lo que ha de venir. Diez mi razones para adorar. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, oh, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul. I worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. Kids are dismissed. Jesus loves me on him. Five, seven, nine. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong, they are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. loves me for the Bible tells me so Amen what a blessing what a blessing and I just got to tell you that special that Veronique just did that that is just that sounds just like Veronique doesn't it it just fits her so well and it's such a worshipable spirit for sure. I would invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to John. Anybody know where the Gospel of John is? Help me see if we can find it. John chapter 4. John. John chapter 4. And please notice with me verse 46. John chapter 4 beginning with verse 46. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he had heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Well, you could preach that one right there, couldn't you? The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed and his whole house. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. And, and we're reading and affirming and just being encouraged in what we truly know to be so. But sometimes, Lord, in our spirit, what we also know in our mind, uh, we need to allow to just penetrate and pierce our heart. We live in a world today that truly needs help. And... 
we have a lot of talking heads out there that are trying to tell people how to get help. And it seems to me like most people are looking for whatever help they might need in all, in all of the wrong places. And so, Lord, we ask for help this morning, and we ask for sp specific instruction from you on how to get real help in a time of need. Have your way, Lord, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Please notice again, John chapter 4, verse 50. Notice this portion of the scripture. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went his way. Can I get an amen? How much better would we all be if, in fact, we just got that? The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. Believe. Amen? Believe. What a word. What a powerful word. During his lifetime, Jesus worked with all kinds of people, and he met many different kinds of needs. Sometimes he worked with very poor and deprived, and, and it's easy to get the impression that, that this was almost exclusive. Well, it's true, no doubt, that he did uh, have a special affinity for the poor. But I can tell you, after you study the Bible carefully, you can see that there were all kinds of people. They came in all different shapes and sizes, different stations of life, many very financially well off and many with, with great power. We think of Nicodemus, uh, Zacchaeus, Lazarus, the rich young ruler. And so let's not put our Jesus in a box and say that he's only concerned for the poor. We should be. We probably could do a better job of being more concerned for the poor. But Jesus wants to meet the need of man. Jesus wants to meet everyone's need. And when we read this moving story, I mean, it's, 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 it's dramatic. It's exciting. I mean, every time I read these these passages, I just stop and, and imagine what it really must have been like to hear this dialogue play out and to, to see the interaction taking place. I mean, uh, let's just raise the curtain for just a moment. Jesus is coming into Cana of Galilee. First of all, I had the privilege of, of traveling through Cana of Galilee with a dear friend of mine and some others. Uh, Brother Lance Reeves, a great man of God, uh, and I remember he looked over and he said, Hey, Brother Miller, I just want you to know, right over there is where they turned the water into wine, and they actually had the actual pots that they did it in. And I go, Really? He goes, No. <laughs> Don't believe everything you hear, even from a brother. I'm just saying, okay? So... You know the story. Jesus is coming into Cana of Galilee where earlier, of course, he had turned water into wine. We do know that's true. The Bible says so. Uh, the scene then changes to Capernaum or Capernaum as they say over there. We see this official sitting by the bedside of his sick son. Now, it shouldn't take very much for me to challenge all of us to consider, as parents, the pain and concern that we have when we have a sick child. I mean, I just want you to stop and consider, when you read your Bible, these are real people with real challenges, real lives that were touched by a real God, no doubt about it, my God. You see... I'm sure that the noise about was that, that Jesus had turned the water into wine and, and there wasn't any internet, there wasn't any television or anything else, but the very best way for someone to convey how they feel about somebody is word of mouth. And when you hear uh, about what's going on, it ought to stir you up. Amen? And so thinking about this, I'm thinking that we see something else happening here also. Not everybody who heard these stories had the kind of, had the kind of 
real faith that this man had. That's what's amazing. You know, and I'm sure that he had probably heard about the miracles that he had performed uh, in, in Galilee. And so there was much that he was probably taking into when he was considering what he was about to ask. But I can tell you this, all I have to do is think about as a parent, how he must have felt. Every parent can identify with the father of a sick child, a child who needs help. I mean, if I can this morning, I want to help us all to see some very important truth from this scripture. Number one, the man knew he needed help. Number two, the man came to Jesus for help. So he's already doing some things that most people don't do. Number three, the man took Jesus at his word. And please notice the man found out Jesus had already met his need. I would hope that even this morning that for anyone here today who doesn't know Jesus Christ, my friend, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, listen very carefully. You need help. Know this, you need help. And my friend, let me, may I just make this as clear as possible? Jesus is the answer. Jesus will meet your need. Jesus will save your soul. But I would also like to speak to each and every one of us here. If you've been saved for a number of years, if you're walking with the Lord, you know what I'm talking about. Jesus is still meeting your need. He settled once and for all on the cross, your greatest need, and that's the need for a Savior. But I'm here to say also, He meets your everyday need, doesn't He? He meets your need every hour, if you'll let Him. And so maybe I would say that some of us need to be reminded that in every situation, in every way, I can say, it's clear, as clear as I can say this, let me just say, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the one who will meet your need. How do you get help? Go to Jesus. So first of all, notice this encounter here. Number one, the man knew he needed help. Hey, newsflash, some folks never get that part. The man knew that he needed help. I mean, do you recognize the need in your life? And do you know that if, in fact, you have this need and it hasn't been met, that there are... There are answers that you need to find, but first of all, you need to know that you have a need. You know, you've taken the first and most important step to get help. They say this, don't they? When you recognize that you need help. Some of us are still in that category. We're still, we're still needing to recognize that we need help. I mean, think about it. Maybe you have a child with a physical, mental, or spiritual need. I'm thinking of a father whose adult daughter was uh, needing help in so many ways. She basically needed help in all of these areas. I have counseled with people who, who through the pain and suffering of, of, of sickness and other circumstances... You could see real physical needs that needed to be met. Yes, also spiritual needs, and, and uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But the real truth is, no matter what your need is, I'm telling you, Jesus is the answer. You know, you may, you may even be thinking right now, I've got another need. I've got a need for my family. I've got a need for myself. And, and uh, is this the same Jesus that will meet my need? Yes, it is. You know, you can't get any help until you get to a place where you realize that you need help. And the real truth is, in most cases, that has to do with us personally. For example, in fact, we see that Jesus is meeting the need regarding this nobleman's child. But as an example this morning, let's see how Jesus meets the need for salvation. Because the greatest healing that will ever take place is for somebody's dark soul to get saved. For somebody to, 
to, to be able to say, I once was lost, but now I'm fine. I was blind, but now I see. The greatest healing, the greatest miracle of all takes place every time someone says yes to Jesus Christ, turns to Christ, asks Christ into their heart. And so since sin and the forgiveness of sin is the universal need, let's use this example. You know, there are others, and maybe even this morning for you, as the Holy Spirit speaks to you, you're going to have a greater appreciation for how it really is true that whatever that need might be, Jesus is the one will, that will meet that need. Because if, in fact, you're born again, if, in fact, you recognize that he has saved your soul, is there anything else that he can't do? No, of course not. But, you know, how do we come to realize that we have a need when it comes to salvation? Well, we come to realize this because the Bible teaches us that. The Bible teaches us that, that, that we're all sinners and that we are in need of a Savior. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, we read, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Can I tell you something? Jesus will meet your need. Jesus will meet your need. Please notice with me, the Bible is clear in saying that we have sinned. You want to talk about a long-standing argument that continues to take place? You talk about people not recognizing that they have a need. You would be surprised at how many people still don't appreciate that they're a sinner. I've mentioned this before, but uh, uh, just like Brother Jaime, our missionary... Uh, preaching in the jails. I've had the privilege of preaching in jails 30 years ago. And I can remember standing right there at Calipatria State Prison. And the fellow stood up and said, I'm not a sinner. <laughs> and the other guys looked around. They looked back at me and they just kind of looked at each other like, what? Can I tell you something? My Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And obviously there is none that seeketh after God. May I tell you, if you can come to this place, and you may be here this morning in a crowd this size, there possibly is someone here who needs to come to a place where you understand that, yes, in fact, we are all sinners. Every single one of us. We kind of jokingly say this often when we're out soul winning and sharing we're teamed up two by two we'll we'll if pastor ashley and i were together and we were out sharing he'd probably say something like this we're all sinners and this guy that i'm with this pastor miller here he's the chief of sinners you know and i would say amen amen we are all sinners and so the Bible is as clear as clear can be about this. But the real truth is, most people don't stick around long enough to hear the good news. They hear this and they think this is what it's all about, just telling everybody how bad they are. And that's where it all ends. And that's really not the case. You see, we may not sin as much as another person, but all of us have sinned. There is none other name under heaven given among by men by where we must be saved. And that is so important that we get that. If, if you want to in, enjoy the greatest miracle of all, and our example of salvation is the greatest miracle of all, you come to a place where you understand that you're a sinner. And then notice, please, the closer you come to God, the more you recognize your sin. How true is that? I mean, this is even ongoing and continual. Even after you come to know Christ as your Savior, you, there might be times where you find yourself slipping away and you're, and you're walking afar off from the Lord. You know, we do that. It's a mechanism. It's called hiding from God. <laughs> if we're not taking a good close look at God, then we're not focusing too much on really our own sin. But the real truth is, when 
we stop comparing ourselves to other people and stop comparing ourselves to, uh, you know, the preacher down the street or the neighbor, and we start looking at a holy God, it'll make all the difference. I'll never forget Jeff Gedney came walking into Desert Baptist Church many, many years ago, walked in and sat down, and he began to hear the testimony of another young man who I had the privilege of, of sharing the gospel with uh, one day outdoor knocking, and he was giving his testimony that day because he had gotten saved. And Jeff Gedney was just uh, filling the floor full of a puddle of water from his tears. He was sitting just about where Brother DeHart is sitting as, brother, um, as the brother was sharing and Jeff came forward that day and trusted Christ as his Savior. But you know, not everything just fell into place after that. As a matter of fact, he continued to struggle. You say, well, what kind of struggles? Well, I can tell you for a fact. He struggled with drugs. He struggled with alcohol. He struggled with infidelity. And you're saying, what? I'm sorry, but I'm probably talking about pretty much the average person these days, I'm sorry to say. And he thought, well, I'm saved and I'm still struggling. I'm still having a tough time. Until he finally came to a place where he understood that as, I mean, you would think, you would look over at your wife and realize what you're doing and, and, and realize how disgusting this is. But it wasn't until he recognized that he had sinned before a holy God that it finally got to him. He finally, he finally got it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I am sinning before a holy God. Right. Whatsoever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. And that's when Jeff began to see victory in his life. That's when he began to grow as a Christian. And I'm here to tell you, the closer you come to God, the more you recognize your sin. The closer you come to God, the more you recognize your sin. And then please notice the Holy Spirit convinces you of sin even if you have never seen a Bible or heard a sermon. Now I'm looking at this crowd and that probably isn't the case. But the real truth is God has a way of reaching into the deepest, darkest parts of the earth. All those nooks and crannies and crevices cannot hide from God. We have what we call a 1040 window when it comes to uh, evangelizing the world where there are people who have literally never even, are you ready for this? Heard the name Jesus. That's true. We're used to seeing a church on every corner. We're used to hearing a sermon on every station and, we're, and thank the Lord for that. But there are still even people today who have never read their Bible Sadly, there might even be some even in this crowd. There are people today who, who I can tell you, there are people at work who have never heard a sermon. Except for the one I hope you're preaching when you go to work, amen? I mean, do you know that, that the Holy Spirit works in a powerful, powerful way? In John chapter 16, verse 8, uh, 16, 8, we read, When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and, righteous, and of righteousness and of judgment. I'm here to tell you the Holy Spirit will prick hearts. And a person won't even fully maybe understand what's taking place. But I can guarantee you, after... Uh, years of having the opportunity of sharing the gospel with others, you don't have to put up a big sign and yell and scream. We've walked into homes where, where every kind of sin you can think of is taking place, and with a sweet spirit and a smile, we began to share the gospel, and you can see the conviction of sin coming over that one. That's the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. And you may be here this morning, yes. And you may be saying, you know, I've been coming for a while. I've had some friends invite me, whatever the case may be. Or I'm kind of searching. Let me, let me just say this. You know 
that there's something taking place in your heart. That conviction is coming by the Holy Spirit. And so, here's a good question. Are you ready? We're using salvation as our example of how the Lord has all the answers for every need. When you recognize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior, when you recognize that you're hopelessly lost, what do you do about sin in your life? What do you do about sin in your life? Well, you really can't do anything about it yourself. That's the truth. You can't. When Billy Graham came to the understanding that he was hopelessly lost, he said, well, what do I do? What, what can I do? And the great evangelist, whose name you wouldn't know and I can't remember, said, you can't do anything. There's nothing in your own strength that you can do. You can no more get rid of your sin by your own determination and effort than you can perform a heart transplant on yourself. Some of you might try that, and please, please warn the rest of your family when you do, because you probably won't be too successful. The Bible makes this clear. It is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy that he saved us by, what? The washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 makes it very clear that it's not you. It's, it's, it's the work of the Lord that makes the difference. Jesus can do anything about your sin. You say, what do you mean by that? I'm saying you can do nothing but Jesus can do everything that needs to be done. He can, he can do the kinds of things that only God can do. You see, there might be people who say, I, I, I want to help you. I care about you. And I want to do whatever I can to, to meet your need. But none of us are qualified to meet this need. Only the one who knew no sin who became sin for us, can meet this need, only Jesus Christ. You see, my friend, Jesus Christ is your answer. And what will he do? You know, you don't have to go very far in your Bible before you read tremendous scripture like this. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The prophet Isaiah in the first chapter, verse 18, makes it very clear that Jesus Christ, yes, he was pointing to the cross, that Jesus Christ is the answer. When Jesus cleanses you, you are clean, my friend. Can I just make this clear? You know, you may have tried other things. You may have tried to be good and tried to just get better and, and maintain, you know, Hey, put whatever that sin is, you know, under control. It's kind of like people who say, you know, I can manage my drinking. As long as I have money, I manage to buy more drink, you know. I mean, that's what it is. Jesus makes us truly clean. You know what? Even before we finish this message today, you can say yes to Jesus Christ. You can ask him into your heart to be your Savior, recognizing that he is truly the answer. You see, if, if you believe that he will meet your need, you are exercising faith. And that's what this nobleman did. Jesus says, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to move us mountain, uh, you, are, you are, well, let me just read the scripture. Mark chapter 11, verse 23 says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he hath, he saith, shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, 
What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. May I tell you, I've heard some preachers kind of water that down and, 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 and somehow de-emphasize the power of answered prayer. Oh, well, if you do this, this, and that. Well, of course. The, the more mature you become as a Christian after you get saved, the more mature your, your prayer life becomes and the more mature your asking becomes. But I'm here to believe the Bible. I'm here to believe Scripture. And you know, we've got to get back to believing in miracles again. We've got to get back to believing that God can heal the sick and that the Lord can touch your life and the Lord can, can work in your marriage and the Lord can change that cold heart of your child. Whatever the need is, the Lord can meet your need. If he can save you, don't you think he can meet any other financial need, spiritual need, physical need that you might have? Of course. Might he do it in many different ways? Of course. But you know what we need? We need to see the kind of faith that this nobleman displays here. Wherefore I say unto you, what thing soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them. And ye shall have them. Not parentheses, not a denim. No, this is what the scripture says. You see, the man in this story truly needed Jesus' help. His son was sick and at the point of death. He likely had sought medical aid and had not been able to find it. And he had heard about Jesus, and therefore the next step was reasonable. What did he do? The man came to Jesus for help. How important is it that you understand that you have a need? Now, what do you do about it? The man came to Jesus for help. He acted decisively. You see, this is necessary in, in your need to be met. We are so indecisive today. We've got more information than anybody has ever had at our fingertips than anyone of all time. If you're not, uh, let me just say this and let me be clear. If you're not capable of making a decision, you're not capable of receiving what the Lord has for you. You've got to be decisive about this. I think one of the mistakes that we make today in the church is, we just leave everything up in the air. And we never ask. We don't want to pressure anybody. You know what? Can I just tell you something? Please pressure my friends and family to go to heaven. So you must act decisively. God's word says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's not only found in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, but it's found in Acts chapter 2, verse 21. It is clearly what must be done. You are acting on what needs to be done. You see, maybe for, maybe for a long, long time, you've been thinking, you know what? I sure need to do something. <laughs> I, I, I really, I've been, I, I catch a TV show, I hear a sermon, or I, my friend says something to me at work. I, I, I need to do something. My friend, let me, do, let me do this. Let me take you to where this nobleman is. He knows that this Jesus is his only answer. This Jesus is his only chance for his child's survival. And may I say for you today, maybe you right now know that your only chance for survival is Jesus Christ. What did the nobleman say? The nobleman saith, uh, uh, saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. That's emphatic. That is, that is one who is desperate. You know what? If you don't know Christ as your Savior this morning, I would encourage you, to be desperate. Yes. We can all act dignified and act like everything's just fine and okay. But you know what? I say no. You need to let God have his way. Now, we could say that the nobleman was 
in error by telling God what to do. Boy, we ought to be able to identify with that, don't you think? How many of us still, even today, we think, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to tell God what to do, okay? Because God doesn't know what to do, so I'm going to help him. Be careful about that. There was a fellow who recognized that he needed to let the Lord have his way with him. He was born again, but he was one of these kinds of guys, I don't know, a whole lot like you and I, I'm sure, who would turn it over to the Lord, and then when things didn't happen exactly the way he thought that they ought to go, he would take it back. You ever do that? You ever do that? Well, Lord, I'm just going to give it to you. Uh, let me take it back. He finally, he took the letters and he wrote these letters out. He cut them out, put them on the wall, and it said, let God. Let God. How about that? Might be something that you might want to try. But he still continued to have trouble. And he, he, uh, he, he just said, Lord, I, I, I need help in really letting you have your way. And one day he walked in and he noticed that the D had fallen. <laughs> And then he looked up and it said, let go. The only way you're going to let God is to let go. The only way you're going to see God is to get out of the way. Some of us are so in the way of what the Lord wants to do, we can't see the forest for the trees. We're so busy thinking that we're going to fix everything that we forget the one who can truly do something. In your marriage, in your family, in your health. In your financial need, whatever the case may be, in, in whatever spiritual, physical circumstance you might find yourself in, let go. It's time, and that's for all of us. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how much of your Bible you have read. Let go. Let go. Let go. First... Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Can I tell you, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but it's according to his mercy that he saved us. It is not us, it is him. And then please notice thirdly, thirdly, quickly here, the man took Jesus at his word. You know, you can get to a place where you understand that you've got a need, that you've got a problem, <laughs> and that Jesus can meet your need, and you can even hear from Jesus. But then you know what you have to do? Are you ready? You have to respond. The man took Jesus at his word. Faith is believing. My Bible says in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, maybe you've heard this verse along the way, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not, what, perish, but have everlasting life. You see, for this change to take place, the greatest miracle of all, salvation, for it to happen, you must believe. John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So you, you know you have a problem. You come to the one who can do something about your problem. You take your problem to Jesus and then you take Jesus by his word not Daryl Miller not Maranatha Baptist Church not religiosity or churchosity or whatever but Jesus Jesus and here what what we see happen is so amazing remember what Jesus said to the nobleman he said go thy way Thy son liveth. Now, have you ever had, have you ever gone to the Lord and you prayed and you thought, Lord, I've given to you, I've laid it all on your heart, and uh, now you need to fix it. And you don't even realize it, but he's already fixed it. And you're running off and you're doing this and you're doing that, and what happens? Well, Jesus healed his son. He wasn't there, he didn't see it, he found out later. 
And when he began to inquire, he found it exactly when it happened. Almost simultaneously, when, when Jesus healed this one, this nobleman was believing. And the man discovered that Jesus had already met the need. Can I tell you, before you leave this place, I'm, 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 I'm ready to say this. You say, this would be easy if you're preaching out of town because you know the people you're preaching to. But I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell you. God can touch your marriage before you walk out of this building. Did you know that? I'm going to tell you this. Are you ready? God can, can work in your situation even before we pray. And I can't wait till you find out. Because I've seen that happen in many, many times, in many circumstances. I can tell you of times when I heard about somebody who had a burden to pray for me. And they said, I don't even know what this is about, preacher. And I'm, you know, I'm not trying to inquire or anything, but I just feel a burden and I want to pray for you. And just about that same time, the Lord met my need in a special way. You see, this is old-fashioned truth that we're afraid to step up and say still happens. God is in the miracle-working business. The greatest miracle of all, salvation. If you're here and he has saved your soul, you've experienced the greatest miracle of all. But what about every other area of your life? God will meet your need. We see the man discovered that Jesus, yes, had already met the need. And that's where we all need to be. John chapter 4 verse 52, then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. How about that? And they said unto him, yesterday. At the seventh hour, the fever left him. I'm here to say that maybe for someone here this morning, you need to know this. This same Jesus, this same Jesus is what you need. Have you come to a place where you understand that this is the answer? That everything else you've tried hasn't worked? Everything continues to come up short? Can I tell you? Whether you're visiting with us for the first time or you've been here for a long time, no matter what the case may be, I would be remiss if I didn't implore you right now during this invitation to say yes to Jesus Christ. Ask him into your heart to be your Savior. You can come forward during the invitation and we'll show you from a Bible if you have any more questions about how, how to be saved. And I'm here to tell you, I'm thankful that it, it's not the most complicated thing in the world. Understand that you're a sinner, a mighty sinner, but Jesus is a mighty Savior. And you ask him to come into your heart to be your Savior. And he will save you. He will save you. And if you do that, Please share with us so that we might rejoice with you and help you to grow in your new walk and relationship with the Lord. Let's all stand. As we're standing also, I'm here to say there are some of us who have been saved for a number of years. We're, we're, we're the first ones to talk about how wonderful it is to be saved. And we're not trusting the Lord with our finances. We're not trusting the Lord uh, with uh, important family decisions. We're not trusting the Lord in our workplace we're not trusting the Lord at school and we're we're thinking well yes he saved me but you know that's all that's compartmentalized we'll put salvation over here and everything else no I just want to remind you this morning that this same Jesus this same Jesus who who healed the nobleman's son can touch whatever your need might be I'm here to promise you that Father, we love you, we thank you, we ask, Lord, that you have your way with us during this invitation. Maybe some of us just need to be reminded, come to an old-fashioned altar and just ask the Lord to help us to put our confidence back where our confidence belongs, and that's totally and completely and fully in Him. We look at how He has worked in so many wonderful ways, how he has touched so many lives. We see Sister Delia, just another continued miracle and others that have been touched in wonderful ways. The Lord, my friend, listen, the Lord, the Lord will meet your need. 
Oh, Lord, have your way with us. And friend, if you're here and you cannot say that you know for sure that you're saved, that you're going to heaven, make sure you don't leave this place. Come, come and be saved. Let us show you from the Bible how you might know Jesus as your Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.